the mitzvah tab, vetsiv enu, la asak ben dere, Torah. Please, Jehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Jehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Remain standing as we read from the Torah portion, Exodus chapter 6, 5 through 8, from the Torah, from the writings, Psalms 119.9, and from the Brit Kadashah, which is the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, 1 and 2. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians are keeping in slavery, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am Adonai. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians, rescue you from their oppression, redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. And then you will know that I am Adonai, your God, freed you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to you to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as your inheritance, for I am Adonai. Vagamani Shama Ti Etna Kahpene Israel Ashem Israim Ma Bidi Motam Vezukor Et Pirti Laken a Mole Bene Israel Ani Yahova Vahoseti Et Kem Mitahat Siblot Misraim Vihasalti Et M Me Abodatam Vikaoti Et Kem Bizro Entu Ya Ubish Fatim Gedolim Vilahti Et Kem Li Laam Vihaiti Lakem Elohim Vida tem ki ani Yehova lochekem chamotzi et kem mitachat siblot misraim vehebti et kem el haaretz asher nasati et yadi latem otam el Abraham el Yitzhak el Yaakov venati otam lakem morash ani Yehova. Psalms one nineteen, verse nine. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with the Messiah Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. Alken ata ein eshma bele asher hem pamashia Yeshua hamid hal kem sher kavasar ela liv haruach kitorach ruach ha hayim asher pamashia Yeshua yotziach oti lachaf shim mitorat ha chet vechamevet. So blessed are you, Yehovah our God, King of the Universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. You may be seated. Shout, I am strong. I am rich because of what he's done for me. <coughs> Hallelujah. You know, the Lord is always on time, right? Sister Teresa says she had a word from the Lord. She didn't give it. She didn't give it. She didn't give it. Then she gave it. You know why she gave it today? Because today is the day that I'm preaching on no condemnation. Today is the day, the perfect timing of Yehovah, to continue to affirm, reaffirm his word. If you pay attention in your life, you will find that he is speaking to you all the time, reaffirming his word to you all the time, letting you know how much he loves you all the time. I encourage you, as, as I encourage you to take those notes about the foxes, I encourage you to take notes about this no condemnation because we have to understand holiness. We have to understand what's going on with sin. We have to call it like it is. But we also know that there is power, power, power in the name of Yeshua. You know, sometimes we frequently feel spiritually condemned. We looked in the mirror. <clears throat> and we said to ourselves this morning, are you worthy to go to the house today? None of us would be here, including myself. We asked the question, do we often feel like sometimes a second-class citizen when uh, in the kingdom and tolerated but hardly loved by Yehovah? Sometimes. Do you feel guilty, unclean, no matter how right your life seems to be? Yes. Do you carry a woe is me attitude instead of a it's been I've been made righteous attitude? Sometimes. 
One of the reasons is, is because the scripture says woe to us. And at the same time tells us there is no condemnation. And so in understanding holiness as opposed to sin and understanding <clears throat> his grace as opposed to justice, there is a balance that we need to understand. And what happens is the enemy tips the balance to the one side. Listen, we know that the New Testament teaches that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Yeshua HaMashiach. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. However, knowing what is written and experiencing the reality of what is written are two separate things. All of us have been in this uh, <clears throat> spiritual walk for a very long time, and we struggle with some of the same things that we've been struggling with, even though we know the scriptures. We have them on our refrigerator. We have them in our journals. We have them whenever we need them. We can pull them up, and yet we read them and read them and read them and even memorize them and, and say them over and over and over and over again. But the problem is it's not that we don't know what's written. The problem is it's trying to get it to exist within our lives. So we have to ask ourselves this question, which we're going to answer this question today and next week. <clears throat> As Many days as it took to understand foxes, it's going to take that many times to understand there's no condemnation. When we look at Paul's words, the question is, did he mean that as a believer, we need never again feel condemned regardless of how we live? Or did he mean that we have no reason to feel condemned as love as long as we live consistently in godly lives? That's the thing we have to try to figure out. Or is Romans chapter 8, 1 unrelated to feelings at all? Does it teach that no amount of sin or disobedience can affect our status as believers? Or does it teach that believers in right re uh, relationship with Yehovah are not condemned to hell? Questions, isn't it? We fight with it all the time because we live with evil inclination. <clears throat> we fail him. Not one of us sit here in perfection. You know, the gospel came not so that it can relocate our eternal life from hell to heaven. The gospel came that it would actually change our lives while we're here. There, there's a, a blessing that we're going to live with him. There's a blessing that he's going to come and we're going to be surrounded by him, that, <clears throat> that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool and that he's going to be with us and we're going to be with him. But it really is the power of God is here to change our lives the way we are right now. And he's willing to invest in us because he knew it wouldn't happen overnight or at an altar. What happens at the altar is you saying, I want you. The rest of your life is becoming worthy, if you want to say it that way. Living your life. Whatever it teaches, how can we <clears throat> get it off the written page into the hearts and minds? How can we do that? I've been born again, really, I, I accepted Yeshua at six years old, filled the Holy Ghost at 13, and we still struggle with trying to get those words into our hearts and minds. You know, one of Satan's favorite tricks is to drag Jehovah's people down with discouragement. Says Teresa, I can relate. Had some discouragement. I could go home and write <clears throat> all the things that I've been through and then say, wow, I either was weak and didn't know that he was making me strong or I was just strong because there's a lot of things you go, go through, a lot of things that you've experienced. There's a, there's a trap that the enemy does to try to bring you down to discouragement, tries to bring you to a place of hopelessness, and he makes us feel alienated from our Heavenly Father. I think that's one thing that Sister Teresa was sharing with us. I think that the Spirit of God was saying to us is, no matter what is going on, even the lives of your children or the family or what's going on, <clears throat> Though you can speak truth, though you don't have to move the border or boundary, continue with your standard, love is still needs to be evident. Because he still loves us, doesn't he? This sense of despair that the enemy brings to us, this, this never measuring up. And we got to be careful because sometimes the word of God, as it comes, it comes strong. And it comes strong to jolt us. It comes strong to get us to reevaluate it. But it doesn't come strong to, <clears throat> to, to destroy us. It, it is a, a wake-up call, and we need to take it as what it is. God's not coming with a big bat to hit it over your head. But he is coming to, to, to allow the thunder of his voice to shake us back to some reality. 
As believers, we are to be confident and we are to be secure. And the devil uses the exact opposite approach. He tries to get us then to fall asleep with false assurances telling us everything is well. So we have to find the balance. The balance of this no condemnation, what does it mean? Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, the scripture says, and it also says the same thing in Jeremiah 8, 11, They dress the wound of my people, but only superficially, saying there is perfect shalom, when there is no shalom. So before we can unmask Satan's lies and renew our minds to the truth, we have to understand the truth. What does Romans 8, 1 and 2 mean? There is now no condemnation. Where is the balance between holiness and being ye holy as I am holy and if you don't follow me you don't love me uh, as opposed to um, the grace and the mercy or the justice where's where's the balance in our own lives when we look at our lives and realize we struggle the question we need to ask ourselves is this what does the word condemnation actually mean in the New Testament sense because your thinking of condemnation could be different than someone else's thinking of condemnation. <clears throat> we throw it around a lot of times, don't condemn me. It can be very simple as just trying to instruct them, don't condemn me. Have you ever felt that sometimes? The pastor said that to me, he's trying to condemn me. No one's trying to condemn you, we're just trying to instruct you. We're trying to lead you. The thing is, you don't understand what the word condemnation is. And sometimes <clears throat> you're allowing the enemy to bring that condemnation upon you when you shouldn't have it at all. And you need to understand to rename it. See, Paul gives us the definition since he is the only author, really, who uses this Greek word, this Greek noun in the entire New Testament. Did you know that? That Paul's the only one that used that word? It's a big testament. And he, he uses it only three times, all in Romans 5 and Romans 8. Three times he uses it, <clears throat> and it's the only one that uses it, and he only uses it in that entire uh, New Testament three times, Romans chapter 5, Romans 8. None of the other uh, apostles used it. So it makes it relatively easy then to figure out exactly what he was talking about because he's the only one that uses it, therefore he shall define it. Correct? When we look at the great theme of Romans chapter 8, you have to read all of it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, especially verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> I don't know if I put a portion up or didn't put a portion up, but we can. Let's, let's go there. Let me get my glasses, and we'll do it old-fashioned. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8, because we're going we, we to look at it just for a moment. I, because we had the um, Spirit of God speak to us about it, I think we need to take the time to uh, read it just a little bit. So let me get my <clears throat> glasses, because I can't read it there either. How many can read that? So let's look at Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is no, no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with the Messiah Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. For what <clears throat> the Torah could not do by itself, because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate, God did by sending his own Son as a human being with a nature like our own sinful one, but without sin. God did this in order to deal with sin, and doing, in so doing, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature, so that the just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our own nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants. For those who identify with their own nature set their minds on the things of the own nature, but those who identify with the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death, but having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and shalom. For the mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's Torah. Indeed, it cannot. Thus, those who identify with their own nature cannot please God. But you! Someone say it's but me. You do not identify with your own nature with the Spirit, but with the Spirit, provided the Spirit of God is living inside you. For anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of the Messiah doesn't belong to him. However, if the Messiah is in you, then on the one hand, the body is dead because of sin, but on the other hand, the Spirit is giving life because God considers you righteous. If the Spirit of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead is living in you, 
then the one who raised the Messiah Yeshua from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit living in you. Where's our hope? <clears throat> our hope is in him. This great theme of Romans chapter 8, all the chapter, go home and read it. Let that be your homework, that you study this Romans chapter 8, because it's important to us. It is the law of life in the Spirit. And through this principle, we are able to put to death the misdeeds of the body and enter into a very powerful and glorious walk with Yehovah through this law of the Spirit. What the Torah could not do because the Torah, though it could direct us and show us and we could follow it, still couldn't deal with our nature. Because Paul said, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Isn't that where we are? In anything, don't we relate to Paul in that? We should circle that. Paul, I get you. I understand, Paul. <clears throat> and since this chapter shows us how to crucify the flesh, to live in the spirit, which then we fulfill the law's demand. It is clear that Romans 8, 1 does not give us a license to sin. Let's just make it clear. What then does Paul mean when he speaks of no condemnation? Well, let's let him speak for himself. If you look at Romans chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, let's look at that. It says, no, the free gift is not <clears throat> like what resulted from one man's sinning, for one sinner came judgment that brought condemnation. But the free gift came after many offenses and brought acquittal. For if because of the offense of the one man, death ruled through that one man, how much more will those receiving the overflowing grace, that is the gift of being considered righteous, rule in life through the one man, Yeshua, <clears throat> the Messiah. In other words, just as it was through one offense that all people came under condemnation, so also it is through one righteous act that all people came to be considered righteous. Do you understand the importance of accepting Yeshua? Because if you don't accept Yeshua, you are condemned by the first Adam. That's where condemnation comes. But if you've accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, even in your imperfection, you're considered righteous because the second Adam came with your same nature but did not sin and made a way and bought you back. You're not righteous because of what you do. You're not righteous because of who you are. You're righteous because of who he is and what he has done. It doesn't mean that you sit and become licensed to sin. It just means that he understands you are struggling to become like him. And some days it will be good. And some days it won't be so good. And some days you'll be on the mountain saying, I am doing, I am strong. And some days you'll be in the valley and say, I am so weak, I can't stand it. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, therefore, there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are what? <clears throat> In union with the Messiah, Yeshua. You know why there's no condemnation for you? It doesn't mean that you're not sinning. It doesn't mean that you haven't sinned. What it means is if you sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. If the enemy tries to take you down a rabbit trail, refuse. Acknowledge to him, you're right, what I did was wrong. Yes, what I did was sin. Yes, I'm an idiot for doing it. But, but, Yeshua HaMashiach, the second Adam came and bought me back. <clears throat> Yeshua HaMashiach did not buy me back because I was perfect. Did not buy me back and make me perfect. But bought me back in my imperfection and bought me back and is willing to work with me until I am finally conformed into the image of his son. And it doesn't mean that one day I'm going to wake up and you're going to be perfect. It just means you are being conformed every day. When we look at the world and we condemn the world, the world's already been condemned. You don't need to point that out. What you need to do is point them out of con condemnation to freedom. Adam's sin condemned us to hell. His fall was our fall. Separated from Yehoah and lost. Guilty verdict was passed. We were doomed. But. Someone say but. But through Yeshua. We have been justified, we have been declared righteous, and in him we are no longer condemned. This is why we talked about the foxes, because what you need to realize is that you don't have to have foxes. There is power 
in the name of Yeshua. There is power at the cross of Yeshua. There is power in the glory and the spirit of Yeshua. Know who you are and walk how you are. But don't forget where you've come from. The fleshly nature is damnable. And through it, we are damned. That's it. Every single one of us. But there is a new power at work in us. I said there is a new power working within us, a power called life in the spirit. And through the spirit, we put to death the sinful deeds of the flesh. I don't. The spirit of God within me gives me the power to put it down. It reminds me of where I may be misstepping. It reminds me maybe where I'm not going. But it's still there, not to bring me to death, but to bring me to life. There is power in the name. There is healing in the name. There is deliverance in the name. That needs to be our, 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 our speech. That needs to be our message to our children, to our grandchildren, to our, to our family, to our husbands, to our wives, to our mothers, to our fathers, to our neighbors, to our, to our friends, to our coworkers. Let this message be this. You can be free. They know their sin. They know when they fail like you know your sin and you know when you fail. The difference is this. You should have enough of the word of God and the spirit of God within you. You should not allow the enemy to bring you to a place of discouragement, a place of hopelessness, because you have hope. Hope in Yeshua. Your flesh is different because the spirit of God lives within you. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Yeshua. Amen. If you're a born-again believer, <clears throat> you're not damned nor doomed. Hallelujah. Someone should say amen that you're not damned nor doomed. You are not going to hear Yeshua say to you, depart from me, you wicked one. You're not going to hear it. He is saying you are mine. I accept you fully through my son. Come. Well done. Well done doesn't mean that you arrived to perfection. Well done means that you were running your race and you run the best that you could. And sometimes you did well and sometimes you didn't do well. But well done. You're here. You made it. You've accepted me. You allow the spirit of God to live in me. And I have trained you and taught you and disciplined you and brought you. And you've been free from the condemnation of the first Adam. You know, for someone in your family or the world... <clears throat> who's living a life of condemnation because they're in sin, it takes a moment. Watch. That's it. You know, you went from hell to heaven by saying, Yeshua, I accept you. Bang, done. Didn't take much, right? I mean, when you made that decision. The thing is, <clears throat> we're not pointing to anything that would want them to make a decision for life because we're always looking at death. You're always pretending you don't sin. And always pretending why you can't figure out why they are. When if we could sit across the table and say, listen, I am like you except for one thing. The Spirit of God lives with me because I've accepted Yeshua, therefore I am no longer condemned. I still fight what you fight. Listen, <clears throat> understand what Yeshua said. I have felt your infirmity. I have been through what you have been through. Which is why when he comes to save you, he doesn't condemn you. Because he knows. Why can't we understand where we walk, someone else is walking? What if you turn your back on Yehovah and give yourself to sin? Do you still have the assurance? Well, we have to study the word carefully on this. Search the scriptures from beginning to end. And when you do that, you will find that there's not a single verse that gives godless rebels any kind of assurance of salvation or blessing at all. Again, we have to find the balance. That's not for condemnation. That's to let you know you just can't run rampant doing what you want to do and, and deny him and then expect to have something from him. Romans chapter 8, 13, the scripture says, for if you live according to your own nature, 
you will certainly die. But if by the Spirit you keep putting to death the practice of the body, you will live. Now apply that not to eternity, but apply it to practicality in your life. Which means <clears throat> you're not going to wake up tomorrow morning with life flowing through you, joy, love, peace. You're always going to be looking at something different because you haven't recognized who's flowing through you. Which is why you should wake up every morning and say what? I am strong. I am rich because of what you've done for me. Let that be your proclamation. <clears throat> Not, oh, I can't get up. Oh, no, I hate the, this day. Oh, I don't want to face it. No, let that be your I am strong. I am rich. I am blessed. I walk by the Spirit of God. Uh, the Spirit of God lives within me. There is now no condemnation in me. Let that be your proclamation every morning. There is no assurance of divine favor for those who willfully forsake Jehovah. But here's the fact. That if you are a believer, and if you're a believer, shout amen, amen. Then you're not looking for a way to go back to the world. Listen, <clears throat> let's admit we struggle. Let's admit we fail. Let's admit we sin. Let's admit we go the wrong way. But I'm not looking to go back. I'm looking to fight my way through to the future. And I might be facing a mountain, I might be facing a trial, and I might be facing something in my own life, my sin, my, my evil inclination, my sin nature. But let me tell you something. I'm never going to look back. I'm always going to go forward, and I'm going to fight that thing that's before me. And I'm going to let you know something. The fighting it, and though it's in my life, doesn't mean that I have condemnation because I know there is a power and a spirit and someone who lives inside of me that if I attach myself to, that spirit can overcome that flesh. It's not always immediate because we want it so easy. But Romans chapter 8 is written to believers who want to follow Jehovah, and that doesn't mean perfect people. Just look around, take inventory. Do a census. But rather, earnest Christians who know the reality of temptation and the daily battle with the flesh. And I'm telling you something. There is more flesh to fight today in today's society because the Antichrist has gained <coughs> uh, uh, strength. He has gained position. He has gained position in education. He has gained positions in, 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 in people who have the ears of other people. And I'm telling you, what, what they're being spoken to and spoken about is different than what you went through. And I'm not saying that theirs is greater and yours is less because when we were going through what we went through, we were still going through it and still going through it. But you have to understand the reality. The reality of the temptation, the reality of the acceptance, the reality and the battle that we are in. And we need more prayer for the parents that have children now and our grandchildren. <clears throat> because the subtleness of that which is creeping into their lives changes their behavior and their thinking process. But what if when you woke up, you gathered all your children, your grandchildren, and you said, I am strong. We are rich. And proclaimed that before they even stepped out of the door. What if you woke them up by creeping into the bedroom and just saying, Honey, you are strong. You are rich. There is now no condemnation. If we know the battle is tougher, that means we have to get tougher. Right? We cannot lean back and lay back. If we know it's even tougher for us who have known him, who have walked with him. Listen, <clears throat> every single one of you, so, how, you've been here 30 years, 25 years, whatever. That means you've had a working relationship with Yeshua, and you still struggle. Teresa is a testimony of it, only because she said it. But you can recognize the testimony is yours also. So I've been born again since six years old. Okay. 
give me a patch. Fill the Holy Ghost since 13. That's wonderful. But I'm still struggling to take these written words and put them on our hearts. And if you think that you're not struggling, that you have the opportunity to point to so many other people and not point to your own self, you are so deceived. Again, we're here as a family to help one another. We are to somewhat share. We've talked about it on Wednesday if you come, <clears throat> but it's in the way that you do it. It's in the way that you say it. So let's unfold this. The first thing we need to understand about this condemnation is that we need to understand Jehovah's posture toward us. How many of you ever met someone like in uh, Food Lion or and you, you know how they're approaching you, their posture. You know whether, they're, they're gonna, whether it's going to be a good moment or a bad moment. Their face, how they're they looking at you. How many, if you've been married long enough, you know that when you come through the door, him or her, you, you know if they had a good day or a bad day, whether you're going to say something or not say something, whether you're just going to let them go where they want to go. <clears throat> you know if you say, how's your day? Uh, okay. Let me go back to watching Judge Judy. So you need to understand Jehovah's posture. See, the enemy wants you to think that Jehovah's posture is standing with this bat, pointing his finger and condemning you. Do you know that he's with you all the time? Do you know that he's, he knows your thinking processes all the time? Do you know he knows your heart all the time? And you know he still never left you nor forsake you? Let me tell you, if I eat dinner with you at the Oneg and your brain starts coming out and I hear some things, I'm leaving you. I'm like, whoa, that's too much for me. But he never leaves us. He wants to bless you. He wants to fellowship with you forever. I don't know if I uh, wrote this down or not, but if I didn't, <clears throat> then sorry about that, but you need to hear it again. He wants to bless you. Say, I, he wants to bless me. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to do good for you. He's the one who took all the initiative in the relationship. You didn't chase him. He chased you. You didn't love him first. He loved you. In your mess, he still loved you. When you were condemned, he loved you. That's why he came to buy you back, because you were condemned. He chose to send the son of the world and to seek and to save you. He's the one who continues to draw you to himself. Get his posture. You know, the more miserable a sinner you were, the more he saw you as an ideal candidate for salvation. That's why you're here. Some of you are wretched. I've heard your testimony. Woo! Now, remember, I'm just as wretched as you in theory. And I'm not saying that I haven't done some bad stuff, but some of you, I could never reach what you have reached, never go where you have gone. I'm just saying. <laughs> My path was a little different. I'm not saying I'm, you know, I, we all have our things. Some of you are really loved because you are really bad. And the more you've been forgiven, the more you've been loved. That's his posture. See, the enemy wants you to know you're so miserable, you're so horrible, you're so this, he can't love you. And you need to tell him, he loved me before I even accepted him. The more you struggle, the more he reaches out to you. That's just who he is. And if that's who he is, that really should be who we are. Again, he didn't compromise. You know, <clears throat> sometimes I get annoyed at people on, on Facebook. And the annoyance is this when they say, Yeshua hung around sinners because they're trying to make a point. And the point is this. He didn't hang around sinners. He hung around 12 disciples. Now, he went to dinner with a sinner. He ran into a sinner, but he wasn't hanging with <laughs> sinners. Do you understand? They weren't hanging. Hey, let's, where's, the, where's Yeshua? Hang with some sinners? <laughs> no. He had, a, he had to teach these 12. And what he had to teach them was, when you encounter someone who is a sinner, 
And when you encounter someone who is condemned, and when you encounter someone who doesn't know me, what you need to do is show them me. To love them, not okay them, but to love them. I want you to understand something. If you don't get anything out of this, get this. Yehovah actually loves to love you. I don't know what he sees in you, but he adores you. Do you understand what I'm saying? He loves to love you. He got up this morning and said, listen, I just am so excited that Minister Tammy woke up because I love to love on her. Didn't matter what you did yesterday. Didn't matter what your dreams were. Didn't matter if you woke up in a bad mood. Has anyone ever woken up in a bad mood? Anyone here? Any, yeah, the children are acknowledging. No one else is. <laughs> children, I have woken up in a bad mood. Children, you have no reason to wake up in a bad mood. But he loves to love on you. Sister Teresa was talking about this January prayer and how was it affecting her. You know why? Because when you start loving him, it doesn't mean that he's loving you more. It just means you recognize his love on you. You recognize it. You know, he delights in showing mercy. Not that he wants you to go sin that he can show mercy, but he delights in it. He takes pleasure in forgiving. When's the last time we took pleasure in forgiving? See, if you sin, your whole wants you to come to him in repentance. That's all. He's such a loving father. He doesn't make you jump through hoops. He doesn't take you out of the game and says, time out for a while until I see how you're doing. It's as simple, I have failed. I have sinned. Please forgive me. And what's he do? He forgives. See, what do we do? We raise our eyebrow. We look a certain way. We, what we say is, uh, in time, I will have to try to forgive you in time. It will take time for this to work through. Give me time. Well, you're not godly. I am so thankful when I say, God, I failed. Will you forgive me? He said, give me time. Need a day or two, maybe a year. I don't know. He is faithful and just to forgive you. Why cannot we be the same way? No, I know we can explain, really, and I'm going to take the context of it out of what it really means. <clears throat> but if someone slaps you, you're to what? You know why you're to turn the other cheek? Because that's how fast you forgive them. You forgave them so fast you didn't even realize they'd hit you on the other one. Now again, I'm, I'm admitting I'm taking that out of context, but what I'm saying is <clears throat> it can apply as long as I let you know I'm taking that out of context. Please don't get spiritual. I'm going to go see that. That's an idiom. That doesn't mean I understand it. I get it. I taught it to you. <laughs> don't pretend like you know it from some other way. If they've taken your coat, give them two. If you're going one mile, go two. That's your shoe in our lives. That's what he desires. He desires us to repent. He's not sick and tired of hearing your voice. We get sick and tired of hearing people's voices. Right? That's the bad thing about cell phones. Remember when you used to hear their voice before you had to answer it? Answer machine, you could say, who is it? Oh, I don't want to answer it. Now you just, they can block their number and you're thinking, hello? Hello? Yes. All those people that call you, robocalls, Pastor Kane says block them, and I do, but they call on another number. He does not wish that you would just go away like we wish. 
we understand we're not him, but we understand we need to be like him. You know, he spoke to the prophets. And, you know, you can ask yourself, what if I keep blowing it? Well, then repent. He wants to hear your voice. He would rather that you come back to him in brokenness than grovel in your shame. Because who's reminding you of your shame anyway? The enemy and you and everyone else that thinks they're better than you. And Yeshua never wants that posture. He wants you to understand you failed. I get it. I've been there, felt what you felt, been through what you've been through. I happened to come through because it was important to me to buy you back. I could not sin, didn't want to sin. So he spoke to the prophets, and as he spoke to the prophets, he told the prophets to tell them, turn back to me. No excuse, just turn back to me. See, sometimes we come before the Lord with our excuses. And all he wants to hear from us is, I'm sorry, I failed, I messed up, I sinned, forgive me. And what happens at that moment? He does. Yeah, but, Pastor, you don't understand. I feel condemned all the time. After those foxes, I couldn't hardly get up out of bed. All I could see in my dream were foxes running all around. The foxes is not to condemn you. It's to help you. And that if you find a fox, what do we say to do to it? Kill it. The thing that we need to do is we need to renew our mind. Everyone say, renew my mind. Now, how many know that's an old sermon? <laughs> renew your mind. How many ever heard that sermon over and over again? Renew your mind. Renew your mind. And we can get excited. I can say it by faith. I can say I've said it different ways. I can do an illustration. You can get all excited, jump up and down, shout hallelujah. You can say, Pastor, that's such a good sermon. And yet, if you can't take it the, out of the written pages and put it upon your heart, what good was it? See, <clears throat> forget how you feel in your heart. Ignore what your mind tries to tell you. Just believe the word. What does the word say? So you have to renew your minds with scripture, and that's like reprogramming our system. We upgraded Final Web. Now it's Final Web 2.0. So I'm trying to work it. I'm a preacher. I don't have the mind of some of these young people that know where to click and s s drag. And I try to work on it, and I, they, I called them, and they were like, oh, that's okay. Call me anytime. So <coughs> they connected with my own computer, so they were seeing my screen, and they were saying, you click here, and then you go to here, left side, and click there, and it all made perfect sense. It all, like, fell in line until they hung up. And then they hung up, I was like, what? Because then when I clicked, I clicked and duplicated five things. <laughs> Wrote my blog, draw, uh, dro uh, dragged it over, didn't even know where it went. It went somewhere. <laughs> now, I can do one or two things. I can say, this is too hard. And give up. Or I can say... I need to reprogram my brain because my brain is not familiar with this, but it can be because I'm not an idiot. Right? You know, anytime you say I can't do something, it's, because it's not because you're an idiot or stupid. It's just because you don't want to reprogram your brain. That's it. We hide behind, I can't do that. I'm too old. I can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes, you can. Just have enough treats so you can teach them. You have to renew your mind. You have to renew your mind with Scripture. And that's like reprogramming your system. And in time, it always works. Did you hear me? It always works. 
So what do you got to do? You got to keep the word before you. You got to read it. You got to meditate on it. You got to repeat it. You got to declare it. You got to believe it. You got to receive it. Repeat that with me. I gave it to you. You got to read it. You got to meditate on it. You got to repeat it. You got to declare it. You got to believe it. You got to receive it. I didn't hear you. Maybe it's because I was speaking too loud. Let's do it again. You got to read it. You got to meditate on it. You got to repeat it. You got to declare it. You got to believe it. You got to receive it. Still didn't hear you. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. You got to. Again. Say it again like you mean it. Do it like you're doing CrossFit. You got to read it. You got to meditate on it. You got to repeat it. You got to declare it. Come on. Lift it. Believe it. Receive it. Got to keep the word before you. You know, Smith Wigglesworth says this. He said, read it through. Write it down. Pray it in. Work it out. Pass it on. And the word of Jehovah changes the man until he becomes an epistle of Jehovah. Here's our problem. And I'm going to wrap this up with our problem. But I'm going to give you the solution. Our problem is that we read the word faithfully, but don't read it in faith. We read it faithfully, but we don't read it in faith. It's a nice story. It's a great narrative. I like when he says things like that. But you haven't read in faith. You haven't believed it, understood it, said that's mine, and apply it to your life. We don't really believe and receive what he says. <clears throat> Again, I've been around this rodeo for a long time. I've been one of the clowns in the car. <laughs> for Minister Tammy, been one of the clowns in the car. <laughs> And here's the thing. You hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, and we're still not getting it. We don't really believe and receive what it says. So let me give you an example as I wrap this up. I can say let, as I wrap this up because you don't believe me anyway. But if you truly had faith, it would help me wrap it up. But I know you're all not serious. So let me give you the example. The most powerful example that I can give you is the prodigal son. How many know about the prodigal son? Let me just give you a heads up. The prodigal son <clears throat> had the perfect father, perfect life, right? He was trained up in the way he should go. But at one moment in his life, he decided, I want my inheritance, and I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. He bucked up, thought he could do something, right? Wanted to take off the <clears throat> anointing and the cloth of his father. Move on his own ways. And guess what happened to him? He messed up. Squandered his inheritance. Look at Luke 15, 18, and 19. I am going to get up and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hard workers. He had gotten to the place where he's eating in a pig pen the corn that the pigs were eating, and he realized that his hired workers of his father was living better than he lived. And what he was saying in this is that if I can just go back and be like a hired man, I'm willing I don't want to be a son anymore. I want to, but I understand. I messed up. So when I go back, I just want to be a hired servant. Because you know what? I am tired of eating with the pigs. That's us. Lord, just let me get to heaven. I know I messed up. I know I didn't go this way. I know I probably messed up my destiny. I probably messed up my purpose. I probably didn't fulfill what I was told. Just let me, let me have heaven. Just let me just give me a back room in heaven. <laughs> a little bungalow. I don't even care. A little tent. 
Give me something. I, I don't want a mansion. I know I've forfeited my mansion. I know I've forfeited your presence. I know I've forfeited your power. I know I've forfeited my ministry. I know I've forfeited the blessing of God. I'm in so many different ways. Just, Lord, just never leave me nor forsake. I always just want to do is be back where you are and don't have anything else because that's the mentality that we have. But that's not, not the mentality of the Father. Remember, you have to look how the Father looks at you. So let's look at verse 20. What's the father say? So he got up, started back to his father. But while he was still a long way off, what's his father's posture? His father saw him, was moved with pity. He ran and threw his arms around him and kissed him warmly. I can just see it. Grabbing him, not just one little kiss, but kisses everywhere. Kiss on your forehead, kiss on your cheek, kiss on your lips, kiss on your ear. You just kiss, 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 kiss till you can't get a kiss anymore. Because he was lost and now he's found. This is our Father. I want you to see this. This is our Father. This is why there's no more condemnation. This is how he treats each and every one of us when we return in true repentance. You messed up today. You come to the altar today. <clears throat> and while you're at the altar, when you say, forgive me, I guarantee you, if you could open up the spiritual world, you would sense his hugs and you would sense his kisses on you. He's not back here saying, okay, I hear you. We'll give you some time. We'll see what's going to happen. You could feel him kissing you. He was already looking for you to come back. In fact, as we humble ourselves before him, confess our sins, tell him that we're not worthy, he almost ignores us. Because look at Luke chapter 15. His father said to his slaves, quick, bring out a robe, best one, put it on him. See, the man said, all I want to be is a hired hand. That's all I want. I just want to come back into, my, into the house. I want to be back here. I, I've been eating with pigs. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I messed up. I'm sorry I left. But <clears throat> I understand that I can't be in the position where I used to be in. I understand that I messed up. I understand that I failed. I understand that I can't have a ministry anymore. I understand that I can't have a purpose anymore. I can't uh, go on mission trips. I know I can't do this. I have really messed this up. And I get it. I get it. I just want to be in your presence. That's all. Don't expect anything else. And the father ignores him and says what? Quick, bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring the cat that has been fattened up and kill it. Let's eat and have a celebration. Look, how did he come back home? Raggedy clothes, no shoes. How did he leave? His garments, his shoes, hair's okay. He came back a mess. All I want to be is a hard hand. I get it. I messed up. How many times does the enemy say, you so messed up, God's never going to use you again. You're on a shelf now, but you might get in heaven, but that's okay. But you're not going to do anything for God. You can't speak again. You can't get behind a pulpit again. You can't sing again. Can't get on a worship team again. Don't you dare go to a mission trip and tell anyone anything. Don't you dare even witness about anything because you know who you are. You know where you failed. You know what you've done. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. You come to God, and you come to God because you don't understand his posture. You come to God as a dog tuck with his tail tucked behind, <clears throat> and, and you come and you say, oh, I want us to be in your presence. I I know I messed up and I know you can't do anything and God ignores us says bring me a robe bring me some shoes bring me the ring kill a fat calf it's time to dance it's time to worship it's time to praise because my son the son of mine was dead and now he lives again he was lost and now he's found and they begin to celebrate that's not a one-time thing Look at God's life. It's full of festivals. Can you imagine how many celebrations he's had in your life in a week? <laughs> how many fatted calves had to be killed for you? How many rings and garments he's gone through and shoes he had to get for you? He must have a big closet, which is why he owns the cattle. The posture of Yehoah is that he's ready to celebrate over you when you turn, truly turn back from your sin. 
And that's the message that we need to have to people that are in condemnation or have failed or sin. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. I don't have to tell you it's sin. You know it's sin. I have to tell you you're done wrong. <coughs> you're done wrong unless God wants me to point it out to you. Other than that, once I point it out to you, I also need to show you the point out that he's waiting at the edge of the property for you. And I don't know how long it will take you because he didn't go from his property into the pig's pen. He had to go through some things. It took him a while to lose his inheritance. But where's Papa? On the edge of the property. What does he have ready? Clothes, new shoes, and a nice shiny ring, and a fatted calf. See, that's what the scriptures teach, and that's what we are called to believe. Do you believe it? So when Paul says, there is now no condemnation in those who are in union with the Messiah. We have to identify with those passages in the Word of God, not just with the portions that tell us how ugly our sin is and how much the Lord detests it, but we must understand that He loves us enough to love us through what we're doing. We have to believe him. We have to take hold of his word. We have to conform our thinking to its truth. If not, the enemy keeps us in the cycle of the pig pen. There had to be something in the mind of the son that knew the father wouldn't reject him. He didn't know what status he would get when he returned, but he knew the father wouldn't reject him. Even if he's going to be a hard hand, the father still would receive him. And the father and more than receive him. We are made holy by the word of God. Let me give you some scriptures really quick. Ready? Psalms 119.9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. John 8.31 and 32. So Yeshua said to the Judeans who had trusted him, if you obey what I say, then you are really in my Talmudim, and you know the truth, and the truth will what? Get you out of your pig's pen. John 17.17 17 says, set them apart for holiness by means of what? Of the truth. Your word is truth. See, part of the sanctification process includes getting our hearts and minds in agreement with what Yehovah says, both about us and for us and about him. Your daddy loves to love on you. The only way I can relate is when that, of course, children, but now grandchildren mess up. You yell, you scream, but you just can't keep away from hugging them and kissing them. You just can't do it. It was easier when you had children. Go to your room, I don't want to see your face for a while. But grandchildren, I'm telling you what, when mom and dad, th come here, and they start to cry, you're like, why are you messing with my grandchild? I'm the patriarch here. Then they get in trouble, and then you try to get their eye contact while their parents are not looking. Because no matter what they do, right? Sometimes our feelings are totally misleading. And in fact, few things are more unstable than human emotions. I've been around here. Human emotions can, whew, been on mission trip with people. So your feelings of condemnation all the time could simply be your either failure to accept and embrace what is written in the scriptures. You haven't yet believed what God has said about you. Or a different reason for the uncomfortable feelings that you are experiencing is because God's just trying to tell you to come home. Come home. Either way, we have to start taking those written scriptures on this page and bring it back to life. What do we got to do? Read it. Meditate on it. Repeat it. Declare it. Believe it. And receive it. Amen. Someone shout, I am strong. I am rich. 
because of what he has done. Stand to your feet, go to someone, very gently shake their shoulders and say, the Father loves to love you. Don't believe the devil. Hallelujah. Children, come on up so we can tell you the Father loves the loved one you. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> come on, church, bring the, <laughs> bring the canopy over. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he is good. Father, we come before you in the name above every name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We thank you for these children that are represented underneath this prayer shawl, whether they are Esther, Leah, Rebecca, Rachel, uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, Joseph, Paul, Peter, Nestor. Use them for your kingdom. Father, let them always know that you love to love on them, and <clears throat> that no matter what they do or go, even if it's in disobedience, all they have to do, Father, is to call your name. Repent. And you are there to gather them up in your arms and kiss them all over their face. We thank you for their lives. Let the glory of the Lord fall fresh on them. Let them be an example to that generation. And we'll give you praise always. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. 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 Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. Not yet. Chuck, Chuck, <laughs> Chuck's having a brain fade. Let's move this on. I'm hungry. <coughs> Yevarekecha Yahova Yehovah, he who exists, now before you are presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you, set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.